Okay, Bonada, good morning. Uh, right, hands up if you are not from the housing homelessness sector. Hands right up. It's like being back in class. Right, hands right up. Good, okay. These are all new jokes for you, um, so you'll be laughing. Um, apologies to my housing homelessness colleagues. I've got an entire table of RCT over here. Um, look, the talk that I'm going to give, I've, I've given in a, in a couple of different contexts. One, in, in the Homelessness action, action Group, it was the, kind of the setting the groundwork before we said about looking at what we might, might do uh, as a framework for, for ending homelessness in Wales. So apologies to those that have seen it a bit. I'll let you off, you know, tweeting. Oh, it's great to hear that talk again. Um, <laughs> others, you know, hopefully this is something new and just sets the ground for, for the, the, the discussions that we're going to have today and some of the more specific talks that we've got coming up. Uh, right, so uh, two or three things I'll do. One, just very quickly, I'm going to talk about drivers and risk factors of homelessness. They're going to be talked about a lot. I know Charlotte is going to, going to do, do that in more depth um, and do a little bit of myth-busting that, that John has alluded to. to. Then uh, we're going to, going to talk a little bit about what do we mean by homelessness prevention? What's our goal? Yeah, because you'll hear that word talked about a lot, homelessness prevention, ending homelessness, and I'll just have a little go at defining what we mean by that uh, uh, and set out a framework, and then spend the rest of the time talking about both what we know uh, about the problem uh, and the causes, and then, then a little bit about what works. With the caveat that despite John's praises, oh, we're so lucky to have Pete and the academics, we've actually let you down. There's not a great deal of evidence on what works in homelessness prevention globally. There really isn't a lot. Part of that is because we spend so much of our time dealing with the crisis of, of homelessness. Um, but academics can certainly be blamed for the, some of the lack of evidence. So we bid on the, the drivers and the risk factors. Um, hands up if you've seen or heard uh, the, a phrase along these lines, that we're only two pay packets, sometimes three pay packets away from homelessness. Hands right up, don't be shy. It's like being back in class, isn't it, right? Hands, hands right. Okay, so we've all heard it. It's utterly, utter nonsense. It's just not true. Yeah, and we're trying our hardest to get st folk to stop using it because, as John said, it gives us the wrong understanding of, of, of homelessness and, and how likely we are to experience homelessness. We're not all two pay packets away at all. Not a truth. In reality, um, there are some folk far more likely to end up homeless uh, than others. And I'm going to go on to explain uh, a little bit about who it is that's more likely to end up homeless than not. Um, there, are, there are two key points to make. Well, the first one is that overwhelmingly, statistically proven, the key driver of homelessness is poverty. Yeah. Take a, controlling for everything else, poverty is a driver, the key driver of homelessness. Um, if we look at some of the other factors that might predict homelessness before the age of 30, some of them are, uh, well, as we've said, childhood poverty, but also uh, the geography. Are you living in a, in a housing market that's more pressured? If you're in a, a more pressured housing market, you are more likely to experience homelessness. Adverse experiences as a teenager, uh, school exclusion, drug use, all the things that I think we're going to be talking about in a public health context today. Uh, and then early adult experiences, again, lots of very, uh, very uh, key themes that seem to be coming up in the public health network interest appear here. So we've got leaving education early, unemployment, uh, actually being a renter as opposed to a homeowner, um, illness and disability, uh, social relations, uh, i.e. with peers, parents, um, etc., etc. They're all drivers uh, or risk factors. And the best way to, to illustrate these is because nobody only has one of those risk factors, um, is to, to give you a couple of cases, a couple of examples. So I'll give you two. Um, the first one, right, the probability of this person becoming homeless before age 30 is 0.6%. It's very unlikely to happen. Uh, so we've got a white male, uh, relatively affluent childhood in a rural area, graduated from university, living with parents aged 26, no partner, no children, at 0.6% probability of homelessness. It's not, not going to happen. Quite in contrast, our second case, uh, if you have a mixed ethnicity female, experienced poverty as a child, brought up by a lone parent, left school or college at 16, had spells of unemployment, living as a renter with no partner but with her own children at age 26, likelihood or predicted probability of homelessness is 71.2%. I.e. it is normal for somebody in that situation to become homeless. Homeless is a, homelessness is a normality. 
That's awful and talks to everything that John alluded to. These are structural factors, structural disadvantage, structural inequalities are what's causing homelessness. And there is so much we could do to, to address that. But it's hopefully dispels some of that myth of we're all two paychecks away. Um, right, so what do we mean by homelessness prevention? This is getting, a, a, we're into a little bit of the technicals. Uh, we have a five-part uh, five framework that I'll talk about. One is universal prevention. That's stuff that we can do population-wide. Um, so that might be around our housing markets, making housing accessible to everyone, but also around making sure everyone has a, a sufficient income uh, to get by. Yeah, poverty. Uh, targeted prevention, and I'm going to, in the workshop later, this is a, an area that we're going to focus on. Uh, targeted prevention are those groups uh, or risk factors um, that we know are likely to lead to homelessness. So working with, for instance, prison leavers, folk leaving hospitals that might have nowhere to go, yep. or, 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 or other at-risk groups, LGBTQ+, plus homelessness, etc. Yep. Targeted prevention with groups we know that are likely to become homeless. Uh, we have crisis prevention, and we define that at the moment <coughs> as, look, you're 56 days away from homelessness, i.e. you've been told to get out of your private rented flat or wherever. And if you're in that time period, we call that crisis prevention. That's where most of the work we do in Wales uh, falls when we talk about prevention. And then we've got emergency prevention. Look, that is, if we don't intervene tonight, you're on the streets or you're homeless tomorrow. Emergency prevention. And then the last one that's kind of not quite prevention is recovery prevention. I, you're, you're already, you've been homeless, and recovery prevention is about making sure it doesn't happen again. You know, so are we finding solutions that mean that you're not going to be coming back to services asking for help because you've lost your home? So that's a bit of a language for us to understand uh, what we're talking about when we talk about prevention of homelessness. Right, now onto the, the evidence. What do we know about uh, the problem and what, what works? So as we talked about, poverty is the key driver. We, we, we understand that. Look, in the Welsh context, child poverty, we have some statistics uh, on that. We can, we can map the geography of child poverty. We can target interventions. And we do have interventions, team around the family, etc. Um, and I put just some statistics from, from particularly parts of, of, of London. Um, we're not as bad as some parts of England is the only saving grace. This is a solvable problem. We're not at 50% rates of poverty, unlike some parts of England. But look, the problem is there to be, is there to be seen. Um, so poverty is one thing, and housing markets, as I said, is, is another key uh, part around user, universal prevention. And what this tells you is, look, for those that don't know, you, you, if, if you can't afford your uh, uh, housing costs, you can get local housing allowance. The local housing allowance should enable you to access housing in your local area to be able to afford it. It's part of your benefit payments. Uh, that local housing allowance uh, hasn't followed the cost of, of rental markets. And basically what this map shows you is the gap between what the government gives you uh, and the cost of that housing in the area. And it's just getting worse and worse. So you've got areas where the gap... Uh, on a weekly uh, uh, shortfall is around £50. 50 pounds. Yeah. Where are you going to find that money from? Yeah, you're benefit dependent. Yeah. So we have some major structural, uh, structural issues. And there's a geography to it. Uh, and a little bit about what works, universal prevention. Um, so Crisis did some really good work where they modelled the impacts of certain interventions. And, and uh, the, key, uh, the key intervention that we can make is around welfare. If we address some of the welfare uh, restrictions and problems in our welfare system, then we can make a huge dent on, on homelessness. You're probably sat there going, great, Pete, tell us something that Westminster can do and we've got no control over. That's an easy way out. Where's Emma? Yeah, we have some powers in Wales around welfare. Yeah, uh, and actually the Bevan Foundation are doing some really interesting work at the moment, thinking about you know, what, are our, what are the things that we do have control of where we are taking action around, around welfare um, uh, and looking at some of those powers that we've got and the tools that we can do. So get the cogs turning. What can we do to, to address some of those, um, those benef welfare benefit issues? Um, right, so on to targeted prevention. What do we know, as I said... Um, this is one of our major problems, and it's an area where we can make a huge impact in reducing homelessness. So, uh, leaving prison as a major route into homelessness. So, 16% of cases in our uh, homelessness uh, system, folk coming to local authorities, their, 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 the last place they were in was prison. 16% of the homeless population coming asking for help have come, in, come from prison. 
That's ridiculous. Yeah. That's a group of people that we know are going to leave prison and aren't going to have a place to, to live. Yeah, we could be stopping them coming in uh, to that system. Uh, leaving care. Uh, I'll pick up on just two of the stats. So uh, one third of care leavers become homeless in the first two years after leaving care. That's, and you can tweet this, that's bloody awful. Absolutely awful. Again, it's a group of people we know are vulnerable, we are working with. We have people paid to support. They're in the, the care of the state and they're becoming homeless within two years, one third. Um, and then we've got other statistics. Look, a quarter of single homeless people, of the entire single homeless population, have been in care at some point in their lives. Yep, so that association between, between care, that institution of care and homelessness is, is really clear. Uh, leaving hospital. Look, when I go to, to the States and Canada and you go to their conferences, this comes up a lot. And, and up until recently, I'd listen to, to folk talking. I think, well, thank God we're not in that situation where folk are just being discharged from hospital into homelessness. Yet, in our point-in-time count data, all the caveats aside around quality, but it's, it's a data set. Uh, look, 37% of people in our point-in-time count uh, in 2018 had ever been released from hospital uh, into homelessness, and 6% in the past 12 months. It's still a problem for us. We're discharging folk from hospital into homelessness. Um, or at least not making sure that they've got settled accommodation and sustainable accommodation and support. Uh, and then education, again, we've got statistics on the, the relationship between disengagement from school and, and homelessness. And, and 27%, again, of our single homeless population ha had ever been excluded from school. So that's some of our, uh, our, what we know about opportunities around targeted prevention. What works, we don't have a lot of evidence. And this is where today in the workshop we're going to be picking your brains. What could we be doing better? What's already going on that we don't know about? But it's worth mentioning that the, the, where there is evidence... The main evidence is on, on critical time interventions, which is basically about having folk located, for instance, in the prisons, in healthcare settings, and phasing out support into community support over time uh, for as long as it takes for that individual. Uh, and that has high success rates, and we're just not doing it. And then there's another one around targeted prevention. You remember I mentioned schools. There's a really interesting project in, uh, in Australia, or developed in Australia, called the Geelong Project. Uh, and what this does is it basically takes all children in the school and does a survey of the children and looks at, uh, and the questions uh, that are posed, ask questions about kind of family relationships and security and, and safety at home and identifies those young people at risk and then puts in, in place an intervention, normally kind of family mediation and stuff. When they did this in Geelong in Australia, it's a very small, small place, but when they did this in Australia... What they found after, after two or three years of this intervention, they reduced the number of young people turning up at their youth homelessness services by 40%. 40%. Yeah. We've got very few other examples of, of such impact uh, where we've got, got reliable data. Yeah. So that's targeted prevention. We're identifying young people at risk and then we're putting in place an intervention and it's stopping folk becoming homeless. Again, we're going to talk about that later. Um, other things around targeted prevention that we can be doing, uh, look, across Europe there's some, some pretty good stuff that says actually the moment somebody gets into to rent arrears, um, the landlord has to notify the authorities so that we can get an intervention in place. Again, we're not doing that. Um, that's before somebody's been told they're being kicked out, it's just look, I'm getting into some sort of rent difficulties uh, and putting in place support. Crisis prevention, what do we know? This is the area where we do the most and where we've got the most evidence in Wales. Our system is based around this. Yep. If, if you are uh, 56 days away from homelessness, our local authorities are under a duty to help. There's very few places in the world where that exists. It's great and it's working. Look, we're, we're helping around 10,700 households at this prevention stage. And we're helping about 11,700 households who are already homeless at our relief stage. Yeah, so we, there's a lot of activity to support those households being delivered by our local authorities and their partners. And actually, local authorities have proven to be pretty successful. Yeah, we're, we're up around 68% success rate, and it's been maintained in prevention cases. We're not as successful with folk who've already lost their, their homes. Why is that? Well, we've, lo we've lost one of our, our options. Yeah, we, we can't keep somebody where they were before. Yeah. That's really important. And you know, the most important thing is, 
uh, or one of the most interesting findings of, uh, uh, of what's going on in local authorities, is this success rate here at prevention. Uh, we used to, if you were single, if you didn't have children, you didn't really get a very good deal at local authorities. It was an all or nothing system. Under this system that we've got now, local authorities are being as successful with single people as they are with families. Yeah, that's a great achievement in, in, in Welsh local authorities. So there's lots happening there. Um, right, what works? So we've got this Welsh legislation, but there's also scope to do much more. And John's talked about a couple of those things, but in, in Vienna, for instance, if you are evicting somebody as a landlord, uh, you have to notify the local authority. You can't evict somebody without making sure that person's on the radar. Yeah. Um, uh, zero evictions into homelessness, John's talked about. There's, there's some great talk coming out of, of, of government about that. Um, crisis, I've also talked about placing a duty on other public bodies. Watch out. Hands up, who's in health? Yeah, that might be a route we could go down. I just came from a meeting in Scotland on Monday where that's exactly what they're exploring. When they're looking to copy our law, that's exactly what they're looking to do. Place duties on other public bodies to prevent homelessness. Um, emergency prevention, so uh, look, our rough sleeping figures aren't looking great. Um, they're, again, they're not the most reliable data, but, but rough sleeping's uh, generally on the rise. We know that rough sleepers, that particular uh, population, uh, are facing an awful, awful range of, um, uh, of challenges and support needs. And, and most significantly at the moment is that that population support needs are, are changing. And when you speak to local authorities, it's the, the kind of the emergence of so-called new psychoactive substances. That, that population group is changing, and we're not equipped to, to, to deal with um, the support needs there. So emergency prevention, that's the challenge. Um, uh, same at recovery prevention. I'm going to come on to talk about the solutions together. Uh, we know very little about how good we are at stopping people coming back into the system. You know, we don't have repeat homelessness figures. But what we do know is there is some good stuff out there. When folk have become homeless, if they are hitting the streets, we've got programmes that are proven to work. Housing First, uh, I think we're gonna, one of the workshops is going to talk about today, is probably the most proven um, solution. So a solution that doesn't require you to go through hostels. You know, like the number of people, if you go away and say, oh, I went to a homelessness uh, session and conference today, they'll say, oh, I've got this idea, there's an empty building at the end of the road, we could just put camp beds there and sleeping bags there. The number of people that say that to me. Yep, that doesn't work. This transition does not work. Yep, folk fall out of that sort of system. Housing First basically says, the premise is, you are ready for housing, let's get you into housing and then wrap around the support. Uh, that works. It's proven. It's the only one that we've got really, really good evidence on. Um, but also this idea of people having choice, person-centred support, personalised budgets. Um, and here's a great one. So personalised budgets, we did some stuff with pr homeless prison leavers. Uh, and personalised budgets basically says, right, you're homeless. What is it that you need that will help you find or maintain a property? You tell me rather than us dictating. And this work we did with prison leavers... Guess what prison leavers said they needed in order to maintain the accommodation they'd been provided and, and not re-offend? What do you think prison leavers said? I'm not going to be too much longer, John. Right. What do you think prison leavers said would help them? Housing folk that have heard this one, you can't play. Come on, health people. What would, I'm a prison leaver. I've been given some sort of accommodation. What's going to stop me re-offending and, uh, and losing my home? A job. A job, good. What else? Money, good. I'll take one more. Support, great. Okay, no, none of those. Um, okay, yeah, that did come up, but no, I'm not playing that one. Okay, but that's choice. Yeah, 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 great. It, a gym pass. Give me a gym pass. That, and, and this just epitomises personalised budgets and choice for me. Because in, in, in prison, I was using the gym all the day. Give me something constructive to do in my day, and all these other things might just fall into place. Listen to folk, personalised support. Um, swift action, we can't leave folk on the streets. We can't wait till problems get so significant that we can class somebody as vulnerable uh, enough to help. Uh, so swift access to support. Assertive outreach, uh, that happens, but assertive outreach as opposed to outreach. Outreach is where we go out and we support folk on the streets, uh, perhaps feeding, uh, giving medical care, etc., to enable folk to, to survive, that's important. The key difference with assertive outreach is you're actually saying, my goal is to get you off the street. Yeah? 
I might support you, but the goal is getting you off the street, not enabling you to remain on the street. So assertive outreach. Um, uh, the importance of, our, our, of addressing wider support needs, and, and that's crucial for today in terms of engagement with, with health. Now, those things work when we're talking about rough sleeping, recovery prevention, uh, but it's also important there are some things, obstacles to the successors of some of these solutions. Um, look, we need the provision of suitable and affordable accommodation. And, and I love the quote, there's the Finns that have done housing first so well. There's a guy that says, look, you can't have housing first without housing first. Yeah? We've got to have the housing stock and it's got to be suitable for the, for the various needs that we've got out there. Um, partnership working, uh, etc. we're going to keep talking about today. Uh, the right staff. Where's my Cardiff lot? Where are they? Where my Cardiff? We were just talking about this earlier. You know, when we changed the law from a, a kind of a arguably a, a process-driven law that said you're in or you're out, to now one that is about finding solutions. You know, the number of different skill sets that you've now employed uh, in, in local authorities, where you're, you're in recruiting estate agents, folk that can work with prison leavers, etc., etc. The right staff, but also supporting those staff. Yeah, we're not very good in the homelessness sector of providing um, the sort of care and support for staff, the counselling support, etc., 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 uh, that's really important, and that ties to the last point. So I hope that's useful. It gives a little bit of a, a, a kind of setting the groundwork. It's lots to cover. I hope it's good. I, I don't know if we've got time for questions, but um, yeah, Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. As ever, uh, we've got a couple of minutes here. So if anybody would like to ask a question to Peter, some points. Of course you can. Yeah, of course you can. Thank you. I think I, I should. I, I was supposed to say that. Uh, the um, anybody? Have any question? No. I'll ask one. Okay. Hey, if you could do one thing, implement one policy, what would you do? Oh no. <laughs> Oh no! Um, what would I do? Oh no, no, no! I, I would, I would sort the welfare system out. Would be my my main one. But I, yeah, that's what I would do. Partly because I we we trace it all back to poverty. Yeah, that's our key issue. Uh, so if we can deal with that, so much of the other stuff is is going to be okay. Yeah. So, uh, you, you talk about how poor the research up in space is, and what's affected. Thanks, thanks for coming back to that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, yeah. <laughs> Love it there. <laughs> uh, but Wales is an, uh, an interesting area because we're a small country, three million people, we've got a lot of policy autonomy, we've got some great data sets, particularly on health and great link data. But if we design our policy right, we, we have the opportunity to evaluate well in a way others will struggle. And I guess the question is do you think we're up for it and, and can we do that? Wow, it's almost like I planted him in the audience. That was great. Okay, <laughs> let's talk about linked data, which is my other day job. Um, good, yeah, it's incredible. For those that don't know, in Wales, we have individual level health data, GP, emergency uh, uh, A&E data, there ready to be linked. So your A&E data, etc. Um, we do not have the equivalent in homelessness data in that database. And yet, local authorities do have that data, which is quite rare globally. So local authorities are collecting that individual level data, but it gets returned to government in an aggregated form, which destroys all possibility of doing that analysis. We've worked, it took three years to get one local authority's data into that system, and now we're working with it and we're, link, we're linking it. So we've linked the health and homes data, and it's letting us answer some important questions, supporting people data too. Um, but there's also other opportunities. I've just had the Police and Crime Commissioner sign off to get the South Wales Police data into that same system. That took two years. But you're dead right. We're small enough to be able to do that and to get that data in. That does then let us answer some of those, of those questions. But it's also, again, I was uh, talking to Cheryl today, you know, they, they've changed the system of commissioning services and delivering services. And now want to evaluate that approach. But we, we need to build in, you know, my reply was, well, what's the budget? Yeah? Um, we need to build in, as health are so good at, you know, if you intervene in health, there's an evaluation that comes with it, always. And there's a budget for that. 
that, that just isn't happening in, in the homelessness context. We've brought in, bring in intervention. We've, we don't do random control trials. Uh, I, I'm not sure that, that we've had a random control trial in the homelessness sector in Wales, ever. I'm not sure that we have. No, 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 no. Because we're, we're firefighting with services yeah. um, and we could be putting a random control trial. There's all sorts of ethical questions about whether we want to do that and I think that's one of our main reasons. But I also just think we're, we're, we're both a young policy sector. We didn't get powers to legislate and, and, and make policy around homelessness until fairly recently. We're a young academic sector um, that are still skilling up. So I just think we're, we, we've got lots to learn from health. To, to really improve what we're doing in, in homelessness research. But it is happening, those things are beginning to happen. Yes. Would you like, actually, I should have said at the beginning, would you like to say who you are and where you are? <laughs> <laughs> no, my name is Beverly from uh, Midland West uh, region. Relating back to your, um, what you said earlier, I know we're doing something to influence the people in changing the policy around welfare. How progressive are we or how aggressive are we? I'm not sure. Or are we doing something about it? I'm sure we're doing Okay, around welfare policy. Oh, yeah, how are we, how progressive and how aggressive are we in changing the social welfare to make sure that uh, we put a lot of money or more money or funding on progressive homelessness? Okay, yeah, well, the tricky thing is because that's not devolved, that's a Westminster power. Yeah, so welfare policy isn't devolved to Wales, although. That would be a good question for Emma when Emma comes up here. What are we doing? Uh, yeah, the, the reply is from the First Minister is, also, is always that we are lobbying Westminster and we've seen the lobbying to Westminster. Um, but some things are beyond our control there. I guess my case and argument is look, there, there are levers and, and tools that we've got. Things like free school meals that are happening in, in schools. There are, there are things that we've got and small levers that we have. In Scotland, for instance, they mitigate the impact of, of the bedroom tax. Yeah, so they, they, they spend on that. We have tax raising powers in Wales. What, what do we want to use them in, in order to alleviate some of the impacts of, of the welfare reforms that have been put upon us by Westminster? They're questions we could be asking ourselves as a society, and I, I don't know if those questions are being asked, and that's probably not a fair one to put on, on Emma, but there are things we could do if we were minded to, to prioritise them. Um, we're, not, we're not yet doing enough, I don't think. Okay, well, leave it there. Thanks, thanks a lot, Pete, as ever. Thank Just you. Come back.